All right, welcome back. Uh, for those of you that have been with us for the first two sessions today, um, keep us going on time here. We're gonna go ahead and get our third session started, um, which is uh, entitled Relief for Home, Centering Special Populations in Comeback Plans. My name is Tara Wallen. I'm an Associate Director for P12 Policy at the Education Trust. Um, I'm going to be joined by some panelists later in the in the session, and I'll introduce them when we get there. Um, but before we get started, I'd love to just take a moment and have folks add to the chat. Um, and you've probably already done this at some point today, but since we have some new folks joining us, your name, um, what state or district you are with, and one thing you're hoping to get out of this session. So again, we're going to be focusing on comeback plans for special populations. All right, we'll give people time to keep adding there, but I do wanna get us started because we have such great guests. I wanna make sure that we have time uh, for you to hear from them and for you all to ask your questions as well. Um, throughout the session, feel free to keep adding questions uh, to the chat or using the Q&A function. Just be sure you're chatting all panelists and attendees. Um, we'll try to track those as we go. I'll start with some questions and then we're gonna open it up for everyone. So what are we gonna talk about today? I'm gonna to get us started. Um, just thinking about how the American Rescue Plan recognizes the needs of special populations. Then we'll have our panel discussion and some time for audience and Q&A um, before Lynn Jennings will be back to wrap us up for the afternoon. So how does the American Rescue Plan, which you've heard a lot about in our first two sessions, um, recognize the needs of special populations as we're calling it, which is a general name, um, but we're particularly going to be thinking about English learners, students with disabilities, and students experiencing homelessness in this session. So the next couple of slides are slides that you probably saw in the first session today if you were able to make it, but I know we had some point people joining us late, so I just want to make sure we're all starting with the same information. So how did we get here? Over about the last year and a half, as COVID-19 spread, um, there were three federal relief packages. There was the CARES Act all the way back in March 2020, the Coronavirus Response and Relief and Supplemental Appropriations and Relief Act um, at the end of 2020. But then the bill we're going to focus on most today and the one that provided the largest resources was the American Rescue Plan, which was signed in March 2021 and provided about $123 billion for K-12 education, but also included additional funding um, for other education-related programs, nutrition, childcare, all kinds of things that are related to the work we do here. So as I mentioned, that $123 billion um, was distributed through something called the Elementary and Secondary Schools Emergency Relief or ESSER Fund. So some places in your state, these might be called ESSER 3 funds, they might be called ESSER ARP funds, um, but this is essentially funding that was distributed to states and then down to school districts based on the share of Title I that they receive under ESSA. States can keep 10% of this money, um, but 90% is sent down to eligible school districts. And the thing that was different in this bill than those first two we saw in the timeline is that it required both states and districts to set aside money for evidence-based strategies to address unfinished instruction, which you heard more about from Kayla and Allison. Um, and it required additional set-asides at the state level for evidence-based summer programs or comprehensive after-school programs. It also required that states met maintenance of effort requirements, meaning they had to maintain the investments that they were making in education and that states and districts meet maintenance of equity requirements, which means that should a state need to make cuts, it needs to ensure that those cuts don't disproportionately impact the highest need school. So in terms of key dates and timelines, um, I heard the tail end of the Havas session before me, and I think one of the things we've heard a lot about is a very quick timeline for states to submit their plans. Um, States have 
all states have received at least the first two thirds of their ARP ESSER allocation. To get the final one third, they were supposed to submit plans to the US Department of Education by June 7th. But there was some flexibility if a state told the Department of Education it needed additional time. So as a result, we've seen 40 states submit their plans so far. As of this morning, we have 17 states with approved plans. And then once a state gets the money, it is supposed to allocate money to its districts within 60 days. And then once districts get money, they essentially have within 90 days, they are supposed to submit a plan to their state about how they're going to use the money. Um, and big picture timeline is that all of this funding, we're talking about the significant investment needs to be used by schools and school districts by September 30th, 2024. So in this session particularly, we're going to talk about how ARP funding relates to the needs of special populations. So as I mentioned, ESSER funding, um, that big chunk of money that is especially intended to address unfinished learning, the law requires that states and districts both set aside money for that, but that they specifically address the academic, social, emotional needs and the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on underrepresented groups. So within that, they include um, students of color, students from low-income backgrounds, students in foster care, uh, students who are interacting with the juvenile justice system, and three of the student groups that we're gonna specifically highlight on our panel today, and that's students with disabilities, English learners, and students experiencing homelessness. I mentioned there was $123 billion for ESSER, but then there were additional pots of money that could be uh, used to support students and children and education. So the bill included $800 million that was specifically set aside to support wraparound services for students experiencing homelessness. Um, and I think you'll hear more about that from one of our panelists, but that is something the Department of Education has begun to release those resources to states, and then states are in charge of how that funding is used. Additionally, the American Rescue Plan provided an additional $3 billion of supplemental funding for programs funded under the Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act, or the IDEA, as some of you might know it as. And then I think it's really important to know what's not in the bill. And that's that the American Rescue Plan, though it calls out that English learners have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, it doesn't specifically set aside money or designate funding that must be used on those students. Um, and then before I get to our panel, I just want to, you know, note one thing about this, which is I think sometimes when we see that money is set aside for a specific purpose, so for students experiencing homelessness or for students with disabilities through the IDEA, sometimes people go and think that's the only money that should be used to support those students. And it's really important to know that that's certainly not the case. It shouldn't be, and it actually isn't required in law those bigger pots of money can be targeted to specific students. And we hope they're being targeted to the students with the greatest needs, which includes these students, right? So I like to think of that $800 million for students experiencing homelessness or IDA as additional funding on top of the other targeted funding that should be used for those students. So I'm gonna go ahead and get us moving to our panel. Um, I'm gonna introduce them and then turn off my slides. So hopefully we can pull everyone up. Um, but we're very excited to have three guests with us today. Um, Roxanne Garza is a policy advisor at UNIDOS whoops, US, which is the nation's largest Latino civil rights and advocacy organization. Patricia Julianell is a senior strategist at Schoolhouse Connection, which is a national nonprofit organization working to overcome homelessness through education. And Lindsay Kubatsky is a policy manager at the National Center for Learning Disabilities uh, which works to improve the lives of the one in five children and adults nationwide with learning and attention issues. So I am going to go ahead and turn off my screen so I can start our panel discussion. Um, let me do that first. And then I'm hoping our guests, if they're able, can turn on their video. If not, that's okay. All right. And then for one of our uh, support staff, Sergio or David. I don't know if we can update the spotlighting uh, just to make sure we can see all the panelists. That would be great. Okay, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna throw out some questions here 
Um, but for those in the audience, I encourage you, as you have questions, please start putting them in the Q&A. You can also put them in the chat. Um, just make sure you're, you're sharing it with all panelists and attendees. Um, so I'll get us started and then definitely planning to turn it over to some audience questions. So please add them as you have them. Um, so I guess first I want to start a little bit bigger picture. We're going to get into the nuance of what are we seeing in the state plans and what's happening. But for all of you um, who think so specifically about the deep needs of individual groups of students, as you look ahead and you think about what you would like to see be true in 2025, after everyone has used all this money, what are you hoping looks different than what, what schooling looks like pre-COVID. And I will open it up to anybody who wants to go first. Okay, you're all too nice. I'll turn over to Patricia. Polite. Everyone was being too polite. Well, thank you, Tara, and um, hi, Lindsay and Roxana. I, th I think of three things when I think of a new normal for students experiencing homelessness, and they're all kind of big picture things, really. Um, I, I mean, we'd like to see, of course, more robust McKinney-Vento programs around the country with adequate capacity in that role of McKinney-Vento homeless liaison so that they can do identification and really find the students experiencing homelessness to serve them. That's the first thing. The second thing I, that we hope to see is just more state and local education leaders understanding even that student homelessness exists um, and also really understanding the critical role of education in ending homelessness, that lacking a high school degree is the greatest risk factor for, an, uh, for young adult homelessness. Um, so, you know, education and homelessness are intersecting through graduation and beyond. Um, and then the last thing is I'd, I'd, we'd love to see the role of, of McKinney-Vento um, as part of educational equity, we'd love to see that role understood more and explored more so that um, there's greater focus on the intersections of homelessness, race, ethnicity, uh, disability, sexual orientation, and gender identity so that um, we're really, there's really a movement for, towards equity for all of our populations together. Thanks, Patricia. And just for folks in the audience, I'm always conscious of exactly what you're saying is a lack of awareness about students experiencing homelessness. But for anyone that doesn't know, the McKinney-Vento Act is kind of the federal program that provides interest services and provides resources for students experiencing homelessness. But I encourage you all to check out the Schoolhouse Connection website if you don't know much about that program. Roxanne, do you wanna go next? Sure. Um, yeah, and, and thank you again, um, Tara, for inviting us to this panel. I'm really excited to be here with you, Patricia and, and Lindsay. Um, yeah, I would say I'm um, piggybacking off of um, your last slide, uh, Tara, that I think uh, given that, you know, there wasn't a targeted funding for English learners in any of the COVID packages, I mean, I think one thing we're really hoping to see is just more general awareness of the English learner or multilingual um, learner population, their needs, and how Title III, which is the federal funding source, for English learners um, really needs um, more sustainable funding. I mean, that, that, that funding stream has essentially remained um, relatively flat since its inception and in, in No Child Left Behind. Um, and we've really been advocating hard to get that funding to really increase and, and catch up with uh, the growth in the student population of English learners. And that population is only gonna grow so I think, you know, looking into the future, looking into when um, that population is even larger, we're really hoping to see um, really robust funding for English learners and for their needs. Um, and really, I mean, I think in terms of the asset-based programming that we'd like to see more of, we'd really like to see more dual language um, programs in schools, all the way from early ed to high school, really, um, you know, not only strengthening students' home languages, but also strengthening their English language development and, you know, potentially other languages. We really view, um, you know, bilingualism, multilingualism as, as an asset. And we're really hoping that over the next, you know, few, few years that, that especially the sizable investment from the federal government really does um, catalyze systemic and cultural change in schools so that we really start to value the assets that multilingual learners and their families bring, that other students of color, other underserved students really bring to the table instead of continuously seeing, you know, this population of students as just harder to educate, um, you know, students that we continuously need to just be 
advocating for that, that we really do see the assets that they bring and that we are fully funding the schools that they attend so that they're not continuing to attend under-resourced schools. Yeah, and I'll jump in here. So thanks, Tara, for inviting the National Center for Learning Disabilities to be a part of this. We're really excited to jo join Unidos US and Schoolhouse Connection on this. Um, NCLD believes like this is a great opportunity to not go back to normal because normal for our students and students uh, that the other panelists represent have been historically marginalized due to like the systemic issues, whether it's racism or ableism or um, lack of housing that that students have experienced that uh, have put them on a trajectory not uh, like their peers. So um, we're hoping that this new um, normal, as you called it, is better supportive of students with disabilities and students historically marginalized. Um, one thing that we're looking to do is hear from educators on what they would like to do going forward and what some of the things that they've learned. So NCLD uh, worked with Boston University to conduct two surveys of general educators about their experiences in the spring. So this was after a year of being in a pandemic. Um, we, it was about 1,200 for each of the surveys of general educators. And we were really pleased to see that the majority of uh, educators, 87% reported that they still love teaching and that they would do it over again if they had the opportunity. Alarmingly though, 58% of educators felt like they were burned out by teaching. Remember this is in the spring after a full year and a half of uh, likely remote learning for a lot of the educators. And so, and that number increased whether the educator was in a community impacted by poverty or whether they were um, educating a large portion of students with learning and attention issues. Um, but one of the good things that we saw in the survey is that 70% of educators want to use strategies that they learned during the pandemic going forward. And 50% uh, of those educators wanted to continue using synchronous online learning platforms and pre-recorded materials, which is really beneficial for students with disabilities, because that is one thing that they really benefit from when uh, they're in the classroom. Some of the uh, other lessons that we learned from educators is that they want to create smaller cohorts of students to make sure that they can individualize instruction going forward. So to the extent possible that schools and districts can work together to make sure that educators have the ability to work in small groups with students is really important for our communities. Um, one thing that educators also told us was that they really enjoyed the ability to collaborate with their educators peers. So um, due to the pandemic, there was a lot more communication going back and forth from educators and that they wanna continue that going forward. Um, one thing that we were a bit surprised about is that Educators want to continue to use technology such as apps and games to, to support students. So this is supplemental to the general ed, uh, sort of tier one instruction that they do. Um, and finally, I think unsurprisingly to most people in this call, they want smaller class uh, sizes. So I think it's a great opportunity to use the, the funding that we have going forward to, to make sure that the educator shortage is addressed so that students and educators can have that individualized instruction that really benefit um, their education. Thanks all. Um, I started my career as a special education teacher. So Lindsay, what you're saying, I think one of the things someone told me when I started teaching is special education teachers are just really, really good teachers. And they said that because special education requires differentiation. And I think we see that also with teaching English learners. And so, I'm excited to hear that teachers are interested in learning more about those practices and continuing them. Um, I think you all mentioned this in some ways, talking about engaging various communities and the American Rescue Plan and the applications the US Department of Education have put out require states and districts to meaningfully engage stakeholders. And that includes students, families, advocacy organizations, school leaders, educators, lots of different groups. Um, we're not going to be able to talk about all of them today, but based on the groups and the populations that you work with, we'd love to hear if you just have suggestions or ideas um, for what you would like to see happen in terms of engagement. What form could that take? How do we make sure we're talking to, to family members and students in all the communities you represent? And I'll go ahead and start with maybe Roxanne this time just to change it up. Yeah, thanks, Tara. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I we were very excited to see that that requirement um, because we do think it's it's critical for um, families and parents to be engaged in whatever is happening um, in their children's education, and it's it's especially important for. Um, English learners that there are families who are often not native language native English language speakers um, to be involved and very informed, especially to have information in their native language. Um, so some of the things that I mean we've seen um, work is is really I mean of course have um, either bilingual specialists or bilingual parent um, engagement. Uh, staff members who are going to be able to communicate with parents and families in their native language, that they are aware of any kind of uh, extra safety protocols that are going to be um, implemented in schools, as I'm sure you know everyone on this uh, call knows. Um, English learners are predominantly Latinos or, or speak uh, Spanish at home. And given what we know about how the Latino or Latinx um, community was impacted by COVID, there is um, you know, a very uh, rational concern about um, going back to in-person schooling, having um, their kids expo potentially exposed to COVID, particularly um, when they may live in multi-generational households. So I think, um, you know, having all of these things in mind when you are engaging with parents, with families, um, making sure that you understand those concerns of our families um, and making sure that you are, you know, communicating with families, what are the types of safety protocols that are going to be in place in schools to keep their kids safe, um, I think will help assuage some of those concerns. Um, and I think, again, using the opportunities, we've, we've heard a lot about um, schools or districts wanting to implement after school programs, extended learning time programs. I think those are also um, additional opportunities to potentially engage parents that may or may not, um, you know, be uh, or have a ton of time during the regular school day to, you know, have conversations or come into the school. I think that that extended learning time um, whether, you know, whatever way it looks um, can also be um, a point to, to leverage in terms of how you bring parents and families into the school community and thinking about creative ways or creative times to really help engage families during those, you know, non-typical um, school hours. Thanks. Uh, Lindsay. Yeah, Roxanne gave a great point about uh, communicating effectively around the safety protocols of, of what the school is going to be. We represent a community that um, oftentimes has vulnerable health issues that can be impacted uh, if they contract the, the virus. So constant, reliable uh, information to parents and communities uh, is incredibly important. I, we talk a lot about when students are in the classroom, universal design for learning. But one thing we, we strive to do is have a uh, universal design for communication back to parents. So students with disabilities, they often have parents with disabilities and need to access information in different ways. So making sure that the district and school leaders are communicating uh, in a variety of ways so that, that the disability community can access that information is really important. Um, without talking with the disability community and you start implementing a learning a recovery initiative or something like that, you run the risk of trying to retrofit back onto students with disability, the initiative. And that can be incredibly exclusionary for our students and not very effective uh, in, for, for long-term success of the, the uh, um, initiative. So really making sure that at the outset, um, or on the, at the onset that you talk, you're talking with communities that represent the disability community because they, they bring a uh, perspective that oftentimes is not uh, sort of known in the room uh, typically. So I think um, we we want to make sure that uh, the disability community is at the table and that they're able to, to communicate their needs uh, effectively and accessibly. Yeah, I would absolutely echo everything that Lindsay and Roxanne have said. Um, I think generally what we found is that 
a successful engagement for students and parents experiencing homelessness is really about relationships. You know, you're not going to put out a call on the district Facebook page saying, hey, parents and students experiencing homelessness, come to our meeting. I mean, that's just not going to be effective. It's really about whether it's school counselors, school social workers, whether it is that homeless liaison that I mentioned, who has relationships with the students and the parents and who can go to them and say, we're looking to put some programs in place to help students and we would really like to hear from you about what you think would be a good idea and we're going to have this opportunity whether it be virtual or in person and we're going to eliminate barriers for you to be able to participate so if it's virtual we're going to provide you with you know the hotspot or the cell phone data or the device if it's in person uh, like Ron, Roxanne said we're going to think about what time of day it is we're going to provide transportation maybe we're going to provide food um, and we're also going to make sure there's not any stigma attached we don't want you know, a student to walk into a room and a friend to say, hey, where are you going? And then have to say, uh, the homelessness meeting, no. So, you know, really thinking about also that sensitivity about where and when and how those things happen. But, but I think it just has to be those relationships and them understanding that people really do want to listen to them and want to take their words into account. And we're not just trying to check off a box that said, yes, we did stakeholder engagement. So it, it certainly sounded like one of the themes um, Roxanne, I'll turn it over to you too. I, I'm hearing loud and clear, especially a lot of front end engagement, right? Like the, the need not to have a district plan and then later on trying to figure out what stakeholders think about it. And I think this is a little bit at tension with that, you know, some of the key dates and timelines I showed earlier in terms of how quickly states submitted their state plans and how quickly districts are working on their plans. And so the only thing I just want to note here is that plans are, are just that, they're plans, right? And plans can be updated and modified. And I think it's important for advocates and those joining us today, just to remember, even if there's already a plan on paper that's been submitted or even approved, there are always opportunities for districts and states to keep engaging stakeholders. Um, Roxanne, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I was just gonna add really quickly that um, I, I think another thing to just keep in mind, especially when engaging with um, families of all of the populations we're talking about here is that a lot of the narrative has been um, really looking at this through a, a deficit lens of like what what have students lost over the last year and a half? How have they, you know, how have they fallen behind? Where, you know, where are they at? Like that kind of conversation. But I would also say it's important to consider any, um, you know, in either improvements or, or skills that students may have had the opportunity to learn while they've been at home with their families. Um, I know in, in our instance with, with English learners, I mean, it maybe it hasn't given them as much of an opportunity to practice um, English development, but it has given them the ability to continue to develop their home language, or maybe it's given them an opportunity to, you know, be at home and, and learn other like cultural components from their families. So, you know, in some cases, not, not everything about, you know, students or kids being at home has been um, negative. So I would encourage folks to also engage with families about where they think their kids have, have you know, grown and how that can be, how that information can be used um, to potentially help accelerate learning. Thank you. Um, I think that's so important. And we talk about this in, um, uh, our organizations jointly re re released some recommendations for state leaders um, and the Education Trust also put out some uh, recommendations for district leaders and talked about this. How do we recognize assets and capitalize on those while acknowledging that the pandemic has disproportionately impacted certain communities? Um, so I, I started this off by mentioning that 17 states as of I don't know, 8.30 this morning or when the Department of Education puts out press releases, um, 17 states have approved state plans and another 23 states have submitted plans but not approved yet. Um, have your organizations had a chance to look at those? Is there anything in the state plans that you would highlight as something you think is potentially promising for people to be aware of? Or any concerns that you've seen, uh, particularly as it relates to the students you all advocate for? And I'll start with Lindsay this time. Right. Yeah. So NCLD has had a chance to, to look over some of the state plans. And while some states identified clear uh, priorities for addressing the needs of students with disabilities, a few have uh, fallen short on that. I think that's um, sort of par for the course when we see these state plans, whether they're ESSA or IDEA uh, state plans. So um, 
the Department of Ed specifically said, how are you going to address the needs of these different populations and, and listed, um, you know, the different populations under the Every Student Succeeds Act. And we saw some states saying, like, our priorities for students with disabilities are the same as for students without disabilities. And that just doesn't really recognize the needs and uh, acknowledge what our community has faced compared to uh, their peers without disabilities. So um, I think there really needs to be more of an acknowledgement that uh, different subgroups of students have experienced the pandemic differently. Um, but we have seen some states do uh, some promising things. So like there is a special education shortage. So one thing um, that we saw some states talk about is offering dual certification programs for educators so that they can become certified in special education and, uh, and, and move forward in that process. Another thing we saw is a, a lot of professional development around universal design for learning and addressing the social emotional needs of students with disabilities. So we're really uh, excited about some of those movements. Um, but again, I think there needs to be more explicit um, understanding of what different communities have experienced in this pandemic, recognizing that there, there were tight timelines uh, that the Department of Ed released and that we want to get this these funds out the door quickly. So. Thanks, Patricia. Yeah, I would agree overall with Lindsay. I mean, I, probably the, the most uh, generalized comment that we can make is that homelessness is not addressed adequately in, in most of the plans. And, and again, you know, for students experiencing homelessness, we saw the numbers of identified students drop by over 400,000 uh, during the pandemic after the transition to distance learning. When, when schools weren't able to have their eyes and hands on students, they just kind of lost them. Um, and literally, we don't know where they are. We don't know if they're in school, out of school, what's happening. So, um, you know, students experiencing homelessness aren't going to benefit from any of the interventions or services put in place through ESSER if we can't identify them and get them enrolled in school. So we also would, would really hope to see some, uh, some more deliberate focus on getting those students in the school um, and connected to the enrichment and other supports that might be uh, in place. Thanks, Roxanne. Any observations from you all about state plan? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, what we've seen, at least in the data that has been included in the plans we have looked at, um, really backs up, I think, what what we've known over the last you know year and a half or so, which is that you know, English learners have um, you know lost some of that that academic ground, both well in academic content, but also in in language development. But also the the one thing that that is really concerning is that um, a lot of states are reporting, um, you know, rates of chronic absenteeism that is uh, that is very concerning. Um, so I think, you know, in, uh, English learners were uh, more likely to be learning in virtual environments, and in those environments, they were also um, less likely to be logging on. Uh, because of all, you know, a lot of challenges that I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with, but, you know, of course, at lack of access to technology, to devices, to high-speed internet, um, or just not really having the ability to navigate um, those complex systems from home. Um, so we did see, you know, even um, in Connecticut, for example, chronic absenteeism essentially double for English learners. Um, and then in terms of just um, actual, like, academic gaps, we're, we're We've seen that too in some of the data that um, that states are reporting um, that English learners have, um, you know, the, 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 those academic gaps between um, English learners and their non-EL peers really did widen during this um, time. And so I think while we are hopeful that um, in so, that some of the state plans have laid out, you know, either priorities or um, uh, interventions that they plan to put in place to really help accelerate learning when students are are back, um, you know, we we really think it's going to depend on how how targeted that support is, how it actually like meets the needs of students, how differentiated um, those supports are, and whether they actually um, do support the narrowing of, of the gaps that, that did widen over this last year and a half. Great. Thank you. Um, I think I, I would say at the Education Trust, we've also looked at a number of plans that I think um, one of the themes we were struck with just generally in the plans is that the states, I think, are heavily relying on districts to make choices and create plans. And we saw a lot of states um, 
sometimes providing guidance, sometimes not, um, and really deferring to districts to make those choices. And I think that's just important for advocates to be thinking about that. This is a question to ask your state, but also these are, there are gonna be a lot of individual conversations down at the district level um, to figure out how to use the vast majority of these resources. Um, so thinking about those local plans, um, you know, we're joined today by advocates and practitioners across the country working at various levels. Um, I saw Gabriella from Maryland asked in the chat, um, what questions should I ask to hold folks accountable to the needs of these special populations? So I would love to hear from you all, um, what questions do you think people should be asking of district leaders or state leaders or both? And I'm gonna not do my round robin, but anybody who's ready to answer can come off mute first and then I'll go to someone else. So just saying, what questions should advocates be asking of leaders? Um, I, I mean, I can um, share one, one suggestion I would have is that uh, we've talked about the fact that, um, that these funds should be used for evidence-based practices or interventions, which I think is very important when we're talking about um, actually you know, hoping to see uh, better outcomes for our students. Um, and quite frankly, I, I worry a little bit about how, how that's going to play out and how um, schools and districts uh, may be deciding um, what kinds of programs or interventions they're using that are high quality or evidence-based. And um, I think in, in, in an ideal uh, situation, you would have the state potentially playing some sort of a role to provide some sort of quality assurance and also reduce the burden on districts having to figure figure that out all for themselves. Um, but if there isn't really a, a plan in place for deciding how things were considered um, evidence-based or high quality, I think really asking or, or trying to have a better understanding of what that process has looked like for, for schools or for districts. Um, and you know, we would hope that if, if schools or districts are trying uh, new uh, programs or new interventions, that they really are um, you know, potentially having conversations with other schools or districts, other leaders that have already implemented these things um, and finding out how that's worked in their school or how that's worked with their students and their families. Um, so, so really kind of having a, hopefully a transparent process in how um, certain things were were decided on in terms of like whether they were evidence based and whether they they kind of met that bar for how they should be using these funds and how it's actually supposed to support um, teaching and learning for our most vulnerable students. I'll jump in. I think one one a good threshold question to ask is what what do the data tell us? What can we see there? I think. I'm sure for any of the populations we're talking about, if you look at data on attendance, discipline, graduation achievement, you're going to see those disparities. And I think in terms of accountability, that's something objective to hold up and say, obviously, there's some disproportionate impact here. And so we need to make sure that we're putting interventions in place that's going to support these populations. Um, and for students experiencing homelessness in particular, I think another data point is to look at the number of students identified as experiencing homelessness and compare that to the poverty rate. And you can compare it to trends over time. So a lot of states and districts are gonna see numbers go down over the pandemic. We know that um, for sure. And, and we also know that if you compare those numbers to your poverty rate and you see a big discrepancy, that's a clue that you're missing a lot of students experiencing homelessness. So I think that's also a good threshold question to say, um, if we're not identifying a lot of students, why aren't we and what can we do better? I think uh, we would recommend the one thing that parents or advocates talk about or ask their school district leaders is, are students with disabilities included in learning recovery initiatives? Or are they separate? Or have, is a learning recovery initiative separate from a specialized uh, uh, services that you that th their child is entitled to under IDEA? So we're a little concerned that um, there will be learning and uh, learning recovery initiatives for students without disabilities and then students with disabilities are being separated and being treated differently um, uh, with with those uh, initiatives. So I think the first thing is about inclusion and making sure that students with disabilities have access to all learning recovery programs and that they are separate and apart from uh, special education services. The second thing is uh, around evidence-based practices like Roxanne was saying. I think 
Um, NCLD is really supportive of you know, social emotional learning, but we're supportive of inclusive social emotional learning. So we partnered with the Yale Center for um, uh, the Yale Child Study Center, and we worked with them to do a meta analysis on social emotional learning practices. And they, you know, they reviewed like 11,000 articles, and then they would tailored it down to like a couple hundred articles. But importantly, they found that many social emotional learning initiatives don't include students with disabilities or uh, the race of students in their outcome data. So there's no real clear evidence of which social emotional learning initiatives work well for specific subpopulations. So I think when we talk about evidence-based practices, which we need to talk about evidence-based practices for which populations we're, uh, we're serving. And so I think it's really important that we evaluate those things and disaggregate the data of outcomes uh, based on the different subgroups under the Every Student Succeeds Act. Great, thanks, Lindsay. And I just saw one request in the chat for you to share a link if you have it to the, any of the work that you all did with Yale. Um, we've also been dropping a number of links to resources that all of our organizations have worked on that capture, I think, some of these key themes. We'll be sure when we send this out after with the recording from the panel, we'll also be sharing links to those resources. So if you're missing them, that's okay, you'll get a separate link. Um, we have about five minutes left, so if folks have questions, please keep asking them. Um, I did want to ask Lindsay, uh, Lisa in the chat asked a question, how do we work with schools to use the additional IDEA money that I referenced in addition to the ARP money when students with disabilities have been underfunded by IDEA for so long prior to COVID? How does the money become a boost for kids with disabilities and not just fill in the gaps for, frankly, the lack of funding from before? That's such an uh, incredibly important question. So in CLD, when we think about funding, we think about um, it in, in not as separate funding like IDEA and SF funding, but there's opportunities to use both of those to support students with disabilities. And some of the most successful schools and districts we've seen are creative education leaders who are able to braid different funding streams together to create school-wide initiatives that really support all students, but with a targeted approach to students with disabilities. So um, I think one thing we would really recommend is not trying to feel constrained by IDEA funds or ARP funds or SF funds. Um, but really trying to think about it in a holistic way to support the students in the school building. The second thing is, I think we really need to make sure that we as advocates prove that the, the funding is supporting students with disabilities in this next school year. So we can go back to Congress and say, look, we were able to use this funding in an effective way, and we need to get on a path to full funding for IDEA. I think we were, we're pleased that President Biden seems to be prioritizing funding for IDEA and um, that at least the House of Representatives is uh, focused on additional funding for IDEA. So I think if we're able to, to really bring a good argument back to Congress, that I think we're on a good place, at, at least in the, the perspective of advocates, to, to make sure that we're continuing to push for more funding for IDEA. Thanks, Lindsay. And I think just to connect it for those of you who have been around this afternoon, in the last session, um, around avoiding fiscal cliffs and thinking about sustainability. I know there was a question about how to think about potentially more Title I funding or how, about, how to think about potential infrastructure funding. I think it's important to make sure we're also saying that, yes, the ARP has provided lots of resources that we think are necessary. They are not going to address the long-term systemic inequities in our funding systems. And so as advocates and organizations that do research and analysis, we need to be both um, providing guidance on ARP and thinking about how to implement that well and continuing to advocate for more money at the federal, state, and local level for all of these student groups. Um, just looking at some more questions that have been raised in the chat um, and through the Q&A function, I'll go ahead and issue a last call, um, but happy to answer follow-up questions that come up after the session. Um, there were some questions, well, there was a question about a particular rationale for English learners not receiving supplemental funding through the ARP. Um, Roxanne, I'll give you a second if you want to try to answer that one. Um, I wonder the same thing. <laughs> um, no, I mean, we, we, uh, Unidos US, along with, uh, you know, all, all the folks on this call have been working really hard um, throughout 
the pandemic to really advocate for targeted funding for English learners um, for all the reasons we, we've talked about here. Um, and I think, you know, from our conversations, at least with members of with Hill offices, is that, you know, they wanted to provide the most amount of money in the most flexible way possible so that folks at the state and local levels could make um, you know, decisions that best fit their, their local communities, which is, is great, which makes total sense. Um, but I think for us, what we were really concerned with, with the lack of targeted funding is that um, you know, there, are, there are just so many um, competing priorities at the local level, as we've all talked about. Um, and we are very concerned that at the end of the day, um, English learners and their needs are going to continue to be um, kind of left left behind or not be at the forefront of, of their conversations for how to accelerate learning and how to meet needs of, of students. Um, and so we really think that that targeting is so important um, and, and so glad that um, students with disabilities, that homeless students um, did uh, receive funding because that, that is so important to have that, that protected funding for, for student populations. Um, but it's also a reason why we continue to advocate for even more funding, I think to, to Lindsay's point, why we want to advocate for even more funding through the, um, the appropriations process. And, and we're pointing to that exact um, thing, which is that you didn't include specific funding for um, ELs in the COVID relief packages. We really need you to uh, beef up the level of funding that you are providing to these students year over year, which is actually the more you know, sustainable thing to do. Um, but it's also the right thing to do because um, this set of students did not receive that, that target set aside. Thanks, Roxanne. And I think um, one of the things I'm continuously reminded of that I didn't know about, frankly, when I was teaching in a Title I school is programs like Title I um, of the Every Student Succeeds Act, you can target funding within that. And so Title I funds can be used to support students with disabilities or English learners or students experiencing homelessness. And while those allocations are dis you know, distributed based on students from low-income backgrounds, they can be targeted to support other groups of students too. So I think Lindsay's point about really thinking about the services or the interventions that you want to provide and then thinking about how funding can be braided together or layered together um, to support those services is really important. Um, I could keep asking you all questions and I know people could keep asking them, but I do want to wrap us up on time. Um, I will say there's two questions in the Q&A function we didn't get to. Um, one was for Lindsay asking about creative uh, examples you've seen at the school level. Um, if you have anything you can drop in the chat, feel free to. Um, the other one was particularly about Native American students in native language settings. Um, and I will say uh, we don't have a panel today particularly representing those students, but a couple of things we uh, at the Education Trust have brought up is um, the state and local stakeholder engagement does require meaningful engagement with tribes and tribal leaders. Um, so I think really important to make sure those folks are engaged. Um, the American Rescue Plan provides separate funding um, for schools that are operated under the Bureau of Indian Education, um, which is outside of the Department of Education. So there is some separate funding with slightly different parameters around it. Um, but at a, at a minimum, this is why we have to think carefully about what is the evidence look like for different populations of students. You know, evidence to accelerate learning uh, in native language schools may look quite different than the evidence for other populations of students. So thank you all so much for your time with us today. Um, we'll be sure to share all your great resources in our email afterwards. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to my colleague, Lynn Jennings, to close us out for the day. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Um, I just want to take this time to thank everybody for joining us today, um, sticking with us through um, the last couple of hours, um, dropping in and out of our sessions. And we just hope that this afternoon has been informative, uh, engaging, relevant, timely, and also inspiring as we all continue in this fight for students across the country that have been historically underserved or are being underserved now, are marginalized, 
and really need our voices and to make sure that their voices and their communities and families are at the tables where decisions are being made that will impact them. So um, I want to also beg you at this point now to please, please, please fill out the surveys that is in the chat. We intend to do more of these sessions. Um, we wanna have more sessions where we're talking about topics and priorities that impact um, our um, so many different communities and also that very much get to the heart of the inequities that we see in our school system. So your input, your feedback, let us know what's working, what didn't work, what we could do more of, what we could do less of, um, we all would very much appreciate. And then also, finally, I have to say, this as an incentive, again, if you do the survey, you will become um, eligible for uh, one of our gift certificates. So please, please, please uh, fill out the survey. And then um, I want to also let you know, because we were asked several times about the resources that were shared to, um, this afternoon. We will follow up with an email that includes um, a recording of today's sessions and all of the resources and relevant information that we shared this afternoon. So look out for that email, look out for more information, look out for emails and invites and all of that from Med Trust. We do look forward to continuing to work with you and hear from you. Thank you again for joining us and have a good afternoon and rest of the today, rest of day.